We have people trickling in already. Good evening, everybody. Feel free to say hello in the chats. Uh, hope you're warm. It's freezing outside today. So uh, welcome to the indoor webinar. Good evening, everybody. All new that have come in through recently. Evening. Um, please say hi in the chat. Let us know uh, what you're looking forward to learning today. We'll get started here real soon. Just a couple more minutes, I think, Nicole. Sounds good. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. We are excited to share this with you. More coming. This is great. All right. <clears throat> I think we can start it here in about, let's say, 5.03. So we'll just wait a few more minutes for people to come through, trickle in, and go from there. All right, 
Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm sure a few more people will come through as I am talking. Um, happy Wednesday, November 9th. Um, I just want to start with a quick little thank you for being here. I am Carlos. I'm Carlos Barragan. I'm the um, I'm the environmental educator here at the Laguna Foundation. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick uh, introduction to the Laguna Foundation before we get started and before I pass it on to Nicole. Uh, so if you do not know, the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization, and we work to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Uh, the Laguna is a 22 mile long wetland complex with a 254 mile square mile watershed that encompasses the businesses, infrastructure, farmland, open space, and the people that live here in Sonoma County uh, and in the cities of Santa Rosa, Catani, Runner Park, parts of Sebastopol, and Windsor. And over time, the Laguna de Santa Rosa has been impacted heavily by development within its watershed and across the Santa Rosa Plain. And it now faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. Uh, despite the challenges, the Laguna's biodiversity hotspot with a very special designation of being a wetland of international importance and is one of only 34 sites in the United States that gets that designation. With the help of the public, we conserve and restore these special wetlands by planting native trees, shrubs, grasses, flowers, managing invasive species and collaborating with our agency and nonprofit partners to improve the health of the lagoon. I would also like to uh, uh, share a land acknowledgement uh, due to the work that we do and uh, where we do it and our topic of today. Uh, I'm going to uh, be sharing that the Laguna sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people to raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous people's presence right here along the Laguna and throughout the Laguna watershed. We pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. We share this acknowledgement to speak to past wrongs and demonstrate gratitude for the honor of working for the well-being of the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Uh, even though many of you are probably familiar at this point with Zoom, uh, I mean, it's been, been a few years at this point, but I'm still gonna give quick little uh, refreshers as far as how to navigate today. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, uh, enter them into the chat box. I'll be watching and putting them on some notes so we can go over them at the end of the lecture. Um, and yeah, I think we'll take it from there. Our presenter today is going to be Cole Myers, and I'm actually going to be handing it over to her at this point. And uh, oh, one final thing, pardon me. Uh, we're going to be recording this. So this is going to be going onto YouTube. And if for some reason we can't answer any of your questions today, we will be sending answers and we'll be sending them to you through email. So uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Carlos. Last year, when I provided a presentation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa, Foundation, I focused on the geology of the watershed. Really, what geologic history took place to build the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed so that it looks as it does today? And then what human component has caused changes to the overall appearance? For those of you who don't know me, I teach in the geology department at Sonoma State University. I've also taught at College of Marin in Santa Rosa Junior College. And I have my own business called appreciatingearth.com, where I bring community education to those who are interested, including geology walks and presentations like this, because my passion really is for teaching others about planet Earth, what I understand about how it works, how climate changes. I am truly fascinated and love dinosaurs, but also natural disasters. Natural disasters is really the foundation of my curiosity about planet Earth. When I was 10 years old, I knew I wanted to be a volcanologist. And I went on to get my master's degree in volcanology. And when I figured out that I love teaching, that is the course that the rest of my career has taken. So today I'm focusing on the history of natural disasters in the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed. And you can see here, I have pictures of Santa Rosa from the 1906 earthquake, a picture of Laguna de Santa Rosa in flood, another during drought, and then another satellite image of 
um, one of the most recent years during wildfires. So as I go through this presentation, I'm really going to be talking about the topography of disasters, earthquakes that have taken place in the past, how we should expect earthquakes to take place in the future, especially how is it going to affect the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed. I'll also look at landslides, especially in relation to earthquakes and flooding. We'll look at weather events such as fires, wildfires, and how those wildfires have changed over the course of history, especially in recent years. We'll look at the history of floods and a little tiny bit should I have time to go into some recent climate trends. I have lived in Sonoma County since 1989 and I absolutely love living here. And though we've had our share of natural disasters in recent history, we also are a incredibly well-prepared community when it comes to dealing with the hazards of the region that we live in. There is nowhere on this planet that is free of natural hazards. That's just part of living on planet Earth. So some of the hazards that are present here in Sonoma County include the earthquakes and landslide, landslides, fires, and floods. And as we look at those events that occurred in the past, we can use our understanding of them to teach us how to prepare for the future, because change is inevitable. In fact, many of the changes have led to the topography that we love so much in this area. So I'll be going over each one of these, but for example, we have some Sonoma County hazard mitigation plans that come from this county of Sonoma. And here we have earthquake shaking potential. Notice that the color code basically shows as you go through red and into purple, there's increasing earthquake hazard data. So all of these areas that I'm just kind of trying to trace over with my little pen here, these areas that are in purple, those are where the main faults are, and I'll be showing you images of where those are. So the shaking is expected to be most intense where the faults exist. But then there's other factors associated with topography that will enhance the shaking in some areas. For example, the areas adjacent to Laguna de Santa Rosa. So I'll go into some of those um, amplified shaking hazards that we want to be aware of. In the bottom right corner, I have the hazard mitigation plan for 100 year flood zone. And we see this area that I'm going to circle in red is the Laguna de Santa Rosa because of course Laguna means lake. So this is literally Lake of Santa Rosa. And we will see historical pictures of when this was in fact a series of lakes. And today this continues to be a floodplain. So water drains into the Laguna de Santa Rosa and therefore, when weather events cause a large amount of precipitation, we expect flooding in this region, as we've seen in the past. <clears throat> I'm also going to go into at least a little bit of the history of wildfires, because it is the locations of fault lines that have built up where our mountains are relative to our valleys. And those fault lines also determine how rivers flow. And the river flow, therefore, has a role to play in how atmospheric pressure moves, what we call wind, and how that wind drives wildfires. So we're going to see this interplay between floods and fires, earthquakes and landslides, and how they're all interrelated relative to topography. So I have to start a little bit further back in the past to help us understand the terrain, the geologic materials that underlie the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So in geology, when we use the word terrain, we're essentially saying this is a region when we map it has a common geologic origin. So left side of the screen, everything that you see that has this diagonal pattern that goes from upper left down to diagonally to the right, those are all areas where the rocks formed in the ocean. Most of California formed in the ocean. We've only very recently in Sonoma County actually been part of the terrestrial world. We have a very long history of a marine existence. We see the areas that are just colored white that have no pattern within them. We call those cover terrains. So that's essentially saying 
there is sediment or broken rock, things like sand and mud that have been laid atop that deeper oceanic terrain, which we can see in this wonderful Sonoma County geology cross section. Everything that's in this turquoise color, we call this the Franciscan complex. The Franciscan complex has a rich geologic history, but essentially it formed as a very large body of rock that formed deep in the ocean. And it makes up what we call the bedrock of this region. It's generally solidified. So rather than like loose sediment sand that would run through your fingers, it's solidified or lithified rock. So sandstone, as well as things like shale, we see a whole series of rocks that make up the Franciscan complex. It's in fact complex because it's made out of so many different kinds of rocks. That is really what underlies Sonoma County in general, or at least that which is east of the San Andreas Fault. And the cover terrain is really important to the story of Laguna de Santa Rosa because that cover terrain, or for example, what we see in orange, that's Sonoma Volcanics, volcanic rocks. What we see in this gray color, that's the Petaluma Formation. And in another gray with little dots, that's the Wilson Grove Formation. And then atop that we have alluvium. Alluvium is this white color with little dots. It's the same thing as cover. These are the rocks that overlay the Franciscan. These are the rocks that the Laguna de Santa Rosa has formed upon. In general, we can say that the Laguna de Santa Rosa has formed upon uplifted rocks. Remember, these are rocks that formed in the ocean and they're now above sea level. So geologic forces has quite literally lifted the Franciscan complex up until it is now above the waves, higher than sea level. And then through the course of geologic processes, volcanic rocks were erupted and laid atop, mantled atop those marine sediments that are now part of the terrestrial surface. But one of the things that you can see so nicely on this cross section or this side view of the geology, is notice here on the west side where I just put an X, on the west side of the Santa Rosa Valley, it's a little lower in elevation than what we see on the east. And therefore, as rivers drain off of these high points from the east, and those rivers bring water that drains to the west, that water accumulates on the west, the low point of the valley, creating the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So really, I'm gonna be focusing on that underlying Franciscan formation and those layers that have formed atop it. Perfect. We are right there, right where this yellow star is adjacent to Sevastopol. What about those orange rocks though? I mentioned that they were volcanic and therefore that's an important part of natural history of natural disasters in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Now those volcanic rocks, we generally call the Sonoma volcanics. The Sonoma volcanics erupted over the course of several million years and are the result of geologic processes that are actually fairly rare, especially compared to other aspects of volcanism. It's not the Hawaii style volcanoes. It's not even technically the Mount St. Helens style volcanoes. Instead, these volcanic eruptions that produce the highlands to the east of us, for example, Sonoma Mountain is made mostly of Sonoma volcanics. These eruptions occurred as a result of the formation of the San Andreas Fault System. So long ago, as a result of two tectonic plates coming together and starting to slide or smear past each other on what we call a transform tectonic boundary. As that process of smearing and sliding past to form the San Andreas Fault System took place, it opened up windows or holes in the crust through which magma from deep inside the earth was able to rise through those windows, through those holes. And that magma upon making it to the surface of the earth became lava that erupted up through volcanoes. This process took place in the past. The San Andreas has since grown further to the Northwest and those windows have closed. So Santa Rosa area is not gonna have any 
local volcanic eruptions into the future. There's no longer a source of magma. So we can say very happily that these volcanoes are now extinct in Sonoma County. But the faults that were partially responsible for allowing that magma to rise to the surface, those faults still exist and they're still moving and they're still creating uplift. That which uplifted the deep rocks has also uplifted the mountains relative to the valleys of today. The San Andreas fault system is a dense fault network. So we have many thousands of faults that actually make up the San Andreas fault system as a whole. The San Andreas fault just happens to be one of the most famous of those faults within the system. So here's the San Andreas here, I'm on the right side map. I just kind of highlighted part of it in red. Over here, we see all of these black lines that have names, some of them have teeth, some of them have dots, but they are all, in fact, even the little red lines, all the red and black lines from here all the way through here. That's a very dense network of faults that's part of the San Andreas fault system. It's part of where the two plates are sliding past each other. Because there's a greater number or density of faults in that region, it has been able to uplift that part of the county. That's why our mountains are a little bit taller on the east side of Sonoma County. Those volcanic highlands being the high points then allow the water to flow westward and pool in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Now these Sonoma volcanics and their counterpart, the Tole volcanics, which are found a little bit more in the Petaluma area in this kind of dark reddish color versus the West Sonoma volcanics seen in this orange color. These volcanoes were erupting between about 4 million years ago and around 10.6 million years ago. But I'm quite happy to say in this history of natural disasters presentation that we don't have to worry about volcanic eruptions in Sonoma County. That is a thing of the past. However, the formation of those rocks, that volcanic rock, has played a very important role in the formation of our topography. So on the right side of the screen is a geologic map. I'm gonna first highlight where um, the Laguna is. So I'm gonna put that in red, more or less tracing the Laguna de Santa Rosa. You can even see that I'm right underneath the words Laguna de Santa Rosa here. So this is the west side of the valley. And here is downtown Santa Rosa. I'm gonna put a box around Santa Rosa. And everything you see in this kind of orange color that's labeled TSV, that's all volcanic rock. Here we have the Rogers Creek Fault. I'm highlighting it in red. But there's other faults like the Bennett Valley Fault, as well as the Mayacama Fault. We can even see some Bastopol Fault underlies Laguna de Santa Rosa. But these faults to the east, they have created a lot of uplift. They've created the lift that creates the mountains. This is important to the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Because as water flows in our creeks, like Matanzas Creek, and makes its way through Santa Rosa towards the Laguna de Santa Rosa, those creeks leave behind or allow for the deposition of some sediments, like sand and mud and silt and other small broken pieces of rock. We can see that when we look in those creeks and we see the rock that has formed on the bed of those creeks. We call that material alluvium. Alluvium is just the term we use to say relatively recently moved small pieces of rock, moved mostly by water, moving from the downhill, the uphill portion of our topography towards the low point, which of course is Laguna. Now that alluvium is moved, of course, by the water flow, but also by landslides. And there is a higher density of landslides in the mountains where the slope is steeper and therefore more unstable. And so the rocks are able to fall down the hills and contribute to the sediment within those rivers. And the rivers carry the sediment over to the Laguna de Santa Rosa, where it is deposited. Because as water slows down, that slower water is less energetic and is not able to carry quite as much sediment. And as a result, it drops the sediments down to the bottom of the river where it now becomes part of that geologic substrate or those layers that make up the rocky part of planet Earth. But notice that some of these areas that are in the darker colored yellow, and these are labeled QGE, 
they have this kind of fan-like shape or roughly fan-like shape to them. And that's because many of these are relatively old alluvial fans. And I have this picture kind of in the center top of Im the image that shows what an alluvial fan is. An alluvial fan is part of the river system. As water flows down the steep slopes, bringing rocks with it, and then forms channels, steeper canyons within the mountains, channeling that water towards the ocean. Eventually, that river leaves that narrow channel of the mountains and approaches the edge of the valley. Now that the water is no longer constrained by topography, it's no longer squished into a small canyon, the water is able to spread out, and by spreading out, it slows down. By slowing down, it loses or deposits that sediment, and it does so in a fan shape. So essentially, it's going to deposit the sediment in its channel till it fills up its channel all the way, and that channel is no longer the low point on the topography. Then the water starts flowing still within the fan, but adjacent to it. And over time, as that river changes location, the channels change location, and it fills in the low point, it creates a fan shape. A famous one, for example, here is pictured in Death Valley. Death Valley is great because you can see the rocks. Now, these alluvial fans have fed and become the substrate of Laguna de Santa Rosa. And as a result, first, alluvial fans are flood deposits that contributes to the flooding that can occur at Laguna de Santa Rosa. But those layers of sediments that have built up over time also are going to have an effect on how the Laguna de Santa Rosa is, how it's going to experience the vibrations associated with an earthquake. So these layers of sediments deposited by water are going to be associated with flooding as well as with earthquakes. We call the Laguna de Santa Rosa a sediment basin. It's a basin or a low point in the rocky topography where water flows towards and sediments deposited. So it's in the low elevation region. It's where water and sediment accumulate. And we can see according to our geologic explanation, that which is associated with the map, that we have around 3 million years of built up alluvium. So there's a lot of deep alluvium. I wanna point out one more thing on this map. Do you see where it says, shows this kind of green line and it says Katati Basin? That basically means that the layers of sediment are thicker. They literally are deeper. So I want you to imagine that you have a bowl. I know, hard to imagine that. You have a bowl for like cereal. That is what that underlying Franciscan formation and even the Sonoma volcanic rocks act like. They're pretty solid rocks. It's gonna be like the bowl itself. Whereas the sediment is like adding cereal to your bowl. And when that bowl shakes, the bowl stays as a single unit, but the sediment within is going to shake both with the bowl and slightly independent of the bowl. So you get almost an amplified shaking. So when we look at these areas that are very deep basins, we recognize those areas are going to be affected by earthquakes in a slightly different way than those areas that do not have deep sediments. So when it comes to understanding how water is actually moving and bringing that sediment to the Laguna de Santa Rosa, of course, I'm gonna have the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed map. Everything you see in orange on this map, this orange line, that marks the edge of the watershed, the point from which water starts to flow. And all of the water in this watershed within this orange line, it all flows towards the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So the Laguna de Santa Rosa, I'm gonna circle it generally in red here. It's this whole area, the low point in the topography, now it's the low point because over here to the east, this is where the faults have caused more tectonic uplift. Every inch of uplift is ca caused by earthquakes. So there have been many thousands of earthquakes that have occurred over time. But then once those mountains are the high points and rain occurs, then those mountains start to get eroded or torn down. Erosion is the lowering process of mountains when that height of the mountains is decreased by the rock that landslides and water flows that rock down towards the Laguna de Santa Rosa. It is that which shapes mountains. 
erosion is what actually creates a mountain range shape and it will change over time depending on what type of erosion is taking place. Is it mostly water erosion? Is it mostly wind erosion or even ice erosion? In this region, it's almost entirely dominated by water flow. So rivers do a lot of the eroding. Landslides definitely play a role. And when we have floods, then we just have a much higher density of landslides and a faster flow of rivers, which means those rivers can carry more sediments and deposit more of it in the Laguna de Santa Rosa area. But when we look at the network of rivers in this area, they're really controlled by faults. Rivers flow parallel to the faults and perpendicular to the faults. So I'm gonna start with our California map because it's a good big picture. Now our tectonic boundary, that smearing boundary where those plates are moving past each other essentially is parallel to the lines that I'm drawing on this map. So you can see that the Sacramento River is roughly parallel to that. So our, excuse me, our valleys and our mountains, they're all parallel to that boundary that is made up of really thousands of faults. So those rivers have a tendency to follow the faults or when those faults are relatively high, cause the water to move from the high point straight down towards the valleys perpendicular to or more or less 90 degrees from the faults. We call this a trellis pattern. The pattern looks kind of like a trellis that you would place in a garden so your vines can grow up it. And that trellis pattern of faulting is really, really common or trellis pattern of a watershed is very, very common in fault topography. So if we zoom in, from California, Northern California towards Sonoma County, it gets a little bit more complex, but essentially we can see here, we have some rivers that are parallel to the faults. So that shows us rivers moving parallel to the faults. And then we see many of these smaller tributaries or rivers that are perpendicular to the faults that are quite literally allowing water to drain off the mountains towards the valleys. Those sediments that the rivers carry, they are going to accumulate in the valleys. And as we move from our Sonoma County view to our Laguna de Watershed view, the Laguna de Santa Rosa portion of the watershed is in fact parallel to the fault topography. So this branch of it, the Santa Rosa Creek branch, it's moving perpendicular to the faults. It is draining from the high point towards the low point. So I have this other map over here on the right side of the screen because I think it's helpful to recognize that we have the high point here, that is Sonoma Mountain. And notice here we have this purple line that I'm tracing next to on the map below, that's the Rogers Creek Fault. So it's what's lifted up the mountain. We also have a series of other mountains that make up the east side of Sonoma, as well as the Mayakama Fault here that is a little bit further to the east. So the mountains are uplifted here, and then the rivers are draining perpendicular to those major faults and building up, the water builds up here in Laguna de Santa Rosa. So when it comes to a hazard mitigation plan associated with earthquakes, one of the things we have to be aware of is the process of what we call liquefaction. So liquefaction is something that can occur during an earthquake. So remember that bowl, picture the bowl again, and put cereal in the bowl in your mind. Grape nuts is a great option for what cereal to put in that bowl because it looks exactly like rocks. Now, if you have the bowl in the cereal and you shake it, yes, the cereal is shaking a little bit more within the bowl and with the bowl. But now I want you to add milk or whatever liquid you prefer into that bowl. So it's going to start to fill up the bottom of the bowl, but the cereal is still atop that. It is higher than the milk level. Now shake the bowl. What you would notice is that the cereal starts to settle down and the milk level starts to lift up. Literally the sediment starts to compact because it's settling down, which squeezes the liquid out of the pore space between those pieces of cereal, aka sediment, and allows that liquid level to rise. As that process takes place, essentially the sediment is moving with the milk. The liquid and that sediment is moving together and the whole thing is acting like a liquid. That is liquefaction, as I will show you here shortly. 
And areas of liquefaction are highlighted on this map as well. Anything that is highlighted in red, these are areas of high, very high susceptibility. And I wanna notice that right through here, I'm circling the Laguna de Santa Rosa because it's all in orange, which says high susceptibility to liquefaction. And that's because there's a lot of sediments, AK cereal, and that's where the water flows, AK milk. And therefore when there's an earthquake, it has a tendency to act like a liquid while those earthquake vibrations are active. And that will play a role in how this whole region responds to a relatively large earthquake. But of course, that buildup of water is also going to cause floods. So we have here, this is a um, map that I've taken from the Association of Bay Area Governments for which I will give you the website at the end of this. And here I have highlighted and asked it to fill in the FEMA flood hazard area. So you can see everything that's in dark blue, that's within the 100 year floodplain. That is the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Luna Laguna de Santa Rosa is the 100 year floodplain. And then when you see that slightly lighter colored blue, that's the 500 year floodplain. So you can see that this flood area, AK the Laguna, is of course where water flows. I found this map as well from the Laguna de Santa Rosa website showing that floodplain. And a floodplain really is just where the water is going to overflow the channels of a river and essentially cause a river to be wider when there's a large amount of water due to precipitation. And on the left-hand side map, you can see this is much more of an elevation map. So everything that you see from this essentially turquoise or bluish color through the green color, this is showing more or less an elevation profile of about 32 feet to 60 feet. So it's really only about a 30 foot change in elevation. So this is the area that's relative, it's the lowest elevation of the Santa Rosa Valley, and it's where all the water gathers. So this area that we see as light blue, it's more in that 30 to 58 foot elevation gain. And therefore that's where we're gonna see our flooding. But again, the reason this is the floodplain is we have these valleys that are perpendicular or parallel to and created by the faults. Our mountains and our valleys are oriented northwest, southeast, because that's the same orientation as our fault lines. And then the valley is lower in elevation on the west side, so that becomes the point where the pooling occurs or the water is able to build up when we have wet years. So the topography determines where the floods generally are going to occur. Which is why I wanted to add in this slide of a geologic cross-section. I know there's a lot going on on this slide, but this is actually one of the best ways for me to show you what I mean by elevation. So here we have in the bottom left, the map view. And what a geologic cross-section is, is geologists basically draw a line on a map and say, I want to know what the earth looks like in terms of layers of rocks and locations of faults along this line. So if we were looking down at the top of a cake, we are essentially are drawing a line saying, I'm gonna cut the cake here so I can see what the layers look like within the cake below this line. So here I've chosen the CC line, which is this bottom most cross section and the D line, which is the top most cross section. I'm gonna highlight where the Laguna de Santa Rosa is for both of these. And notice that these are both the lowest elevation portions of the whole topography. Now, the topography is incredibly exaggerated, as in the, um, the scale used to show elevation does not equal the scale that's used to show distance horizontally. So the mountains look taller than they actually are. But that exaggeration gives us this view of these very tall mountains to the east. The tall mountains are caused by these faults, which do the uplifting. And then the water flows via the rivers down to the low point where it gathers. Now this dotted line where it says water level, that's the water table. So when the water table intersects with or is above the surface of the earth, that's when you have a water body like a lake. 
So in the past, the Laguna de Santa Rosa was in fact a lake because the water level was naturally higher than the topography and therefore water pooled upon the surface. Some of those lakes, because technically it was not a single lake, but a group of lakes called Ballard Lake and Lake Sebring and Lake Jonive. These were all bodies of water that made up the Laguna de Santa Rosa prior to humans draining and or filling in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. <clears throat> this draining and filling in was very purposeful. It was done in especially like late 1800s, early 1900s in order to create agricultural land. The buildup of water essentially was taking up land surface area that was prime for agriculture so there was a very conscious effort to quite literally allow the water to drain out of the Laguna de Santa Rosa and into the Russian River where it could make its way out to the ocean, which is exactly what it does today. A series of levees were put in place in order to cause the water to move exactly where we wanted it to so it wouldn't negatively affect agricultural areas. Sediment was actually brought in to fill in low areas so that the land became higher than the water table. And eventually the lakes no longer existed. But that doesn't change that the Laguna is still a floodplain. It's still where water flows to, even if we don't have those lakes in place today. So on the right side of the map here, we have a historical from 1850. This is showing everything that is in dark blue was perennial freshwater lakes and ponds. There's Lake Joan Ive right there. And everything that's kind of in this turquoise color, those were all freshwater marshes where the water table was right at about the land surface. So it would be squishy to walk upon. And we see adjacent to that directly to the left, a historical surface hydrology showing water flow from 1850. And even notice here, we have this light blue color, and this is from 1859, showing where Winter Lake, a fourth lake that I didn't put on the slide, is right next to, or really at the south part of the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So why, since we have drained these lakes purposely and filled them in so that we no longer have these bodies of water, why is it that sometimes this region once again ends up as a short-term lake? Really, we have to have extreme precipitation events that bring large volume of water to our region, that water flows along the network of rivers. And since all of these rivers feed into the Santa Rosa, the Laguna de Santa Rosa, the water levels all pool here. And there's really only one outlet to get into the Russian River. So essentially it backs up and we end up with this lake-like feature. In order to have those very extreme precipitation events, atmospherically, we have to be in an El Nino pattern. Right now we've been in a La Nina pattern, which leads to drought. So El Nino is gonna bring a lot more rain or we have atmospheric rivers and an atmospheric river is an atmospheric event that essentially brings huge amounts of tropical moisture through our region. Um, last year, I believe it was September of 2021. Time is very weird. Maybe it was October, but I believe it was September of 2021 where we had a large amount of rain within three days. That was an atmospheric river. So those are the events that can lead to flooding in the Laguna de Santa Rosa into the future as well. <clears throat> but overall, this region has been moving towards a drier climate for well over 10,000 years. As the entire world has moved out of a glacial stage of the ice age that we are still in, I'll say that again, we're still in an ice age, we're just in a relatively warm time in the current ice age that we call an interglacial stage. So since the most recent glacial stage ended and the glaciers started to melt and we moved into this warmer time, the overall climate in this region has shifted from wet towards dry. Melting ice plus increasing sea level has been occurring for over 10,000 years. In fact, over here in the bottom left part of the screen, this is a, a essentially his 
long ago digital map. We've recreated this map using geologic data that is depicting what the world, this part of the world would have looked like about 25,000 years ago. YBP means years before present. So notice here, I'm gonna see if I can do this. This is the Central Valley and you might go, that's weird. It looks like it's in the wrong place. That's because our coastlines were in some areas 30 miles further west of where they are now. So much of the ocean water was locked up in the ice that sea levels were generally lower. So as the ice has melted and drained into the ocean, sea levels have slowly been increasing. Generally, that's led to higher sea levels around the world, but much more regionally or locally, that general trend over this period of thousands of years has led to a decrease in precipitation, in addition to an increase in temperatures, which is very normal for an interglacial stage. And that has trended towards increasingly droughty conditions with an increase in probability of wildfires and generally higher evaporation rates. So for example, we have here in this map, I'm gonna put a star on it so you know where I am. This is showing recharge as in surface water that recharges into the ground, but this was between the years 1981 and 2010. And what I just wanted to highlight is that we are looking at for this region, somewhere between 100 to say four or 500 millimeters per year that was able to drain into the ground. But as we go into the future, we are essentially expecting that to decrease and have already seen a general decrease. So over here on the right side of the screen, this is a projected change in climate water deficits for Sonoma County that's saying relative to the years 1981 to 2010, which is what that first map was showing us, how much change do we expect compared to our future years of 2070 to 2099? And everything you see in red is essentially saying a more than 200, somewhere closer to 300 millimeter deficit, as in less than the 1981 to 2010 years. So we're generally seeing this drought. We see that coupled with a projected change in summer high temperatures, where once again, red means an increase in temperature. And so we can see for this whole general Laguna de Santa Rosa region, more, most of the area will actually be warmer in the years 2070 to 2099 than it was in 1981 to 2010. So this process has been taking place naturally without the interference of humans for thousands of years. But the interference of humans in overall natural cycles has led to generally a speeding up of this natural process. It's happening faster. Regionally, as a result of not only increased evaporation and less precipitation, but also we're pumping water out of the earth, overall water table levels have decreased but we're still in a tectonically uplifting environment. So the land is still uplifting. So the combination of those two things taking place is leading to decreased surface moisture and generally increased drought. And as we go into a warmer world, we expect more of those droughty conditions and therefore we know what to prepare for. So in addition to preparing for the climate of the future, we of course are also preparing for our seismic hazards. All of the mountains and the valleys that we love so much, they exist because fault lines have allowed the mountains to lift relative to the valleys. But even the valleys have uplifted. Remember everything long ago was below the waves, well below sea level. Only in the recent few tens of millions of years have those faults quite literally lifted the marine rocks out of the ocean so that we have the topography, the terrestrial topography that we have today. Our landscape is the result of earthquakes. So when we consider shaking hazards, those associated with future earthquakes, which are going to happen because this is still a tectonic boundary, Shaking intensity is going to be influenced by topography. Valleys are going to respond differently than mountains. 
It's also going to be influenced by fault location. Shaking is more intense at faults. And the location of the epicenter or the origin of those seismic or earthquake waves. But it's not even that simple because the way that the ground reacts to an earthquake is also dependent on the depth of the valley sediment. That sediment that has been brought in by rivers will be called the alluvium. The deeper the alluvium, the more intense the shaking. But the saturation of the alluvium or the level of the water table is also going to affect what any one person experiences during an earthquake in any one location, especially in the valleys. So we have created a scale. It's not the Richter scale, which is a magnitude scale, but instead an intensity scale. And it's called the modified Mercalli intensity scale. And we oftentimes just call it the MMI scale. It's a very commonly used scale. And it's a scale that's much more experiential versus the Richter magnitude scale. That's about measuring energy release. This scale is about perceived shaking. What did you experience? What's the potential damage based on local geology factors like those listed in this slide? So for example here, this first picture, this is showing a scenario associated with San Andreas Fault. So here's Petaluma here, here's Santa Rosa. So this is the general region of the Laguna de Santa Rosa watersh uh, watershed on the west side. So this is specifically looking at a San Andreas Fault earthquake. So we can see the shaking generally is gonna be what we call strong on the MMI scale. Okay, this next one is looking at the Rogers Creek Fault. That's what creates and underlies the Sonoma Mountain range. So it's much closer to the Laguna. So here's Santa Rosa here, and here's that Laguna right through here. So the shaking will be a little bit stronger because the proximity of the fault is a little bit closer. And then this is a compilation map that's essentially looking at probabilistic earthquake shaking hazards, where all the kind of dark red lines, those are the actual faults. So here's the Rogers Creek, and here is the San Andreas. And these areas that are darker brown, like through here, those are gonna have the most intense shaking. Good news, Laguna de Santa Rosa is closer to the severe shaking. I know that's not great news overall, but it's not the strongest shaking in the area. So when we look at our hazard mitigation plan for this region, the earthquake vulnerability of emergency service facilities, essentially what we've done is we've mapped out where are the fire stations, the police stations and the hospitals relative to these areas of ex extremely vulnerable to severe shaking. And notice, I'm gonna just highlight right through here, this is the Laguna. So there are areas that are going, expected to shake more severely, other areas not so much. Part of it is because we're between two faults on the Laguna rather than on one of these most extreme fault scenarios. So let me give you an example of what liquefaction might look like for an event in which these sediments in the valley, especially Laguna area, undergo liquef liquefaction. So this is a experiment that was done in a lab where you see there's sand, and then they put a little house there with lines on it so we have something to track. Now they're simulating an earthquake by shaking. The sand itself shakes so much like cereal in a bowl until it vibrates and acts like a liquid, so those structures atop it are no longer supported by true solid. Instead, it is sinking into something that is acting like a liquid. So we expect that in the valleys, for example, where the Laguna is, that liquefaction will take place in valleys and marshes because that's where the sediment is, the sediment that was carried in by the rivers. So those areas that are prone to flooding are also prone to liquefaction. And we can see that here in the bottom right map. Here I have this is also from the Area Association of Bay Area Government's website, this time looking at the earthquake liquefaction susceptibility. So here's Sebastopol. This is the Laguna. And you can see that it's very susceptible to liquefaction for the same reason that it's very susceptible to flooding. It's a low point and all of that flooding and all of that water flow has brought in very deep sediments. 
while the valleys are more susceptible to liquefaction, the mountains are more susceptible to landslides because they have steeper slopes. So in the map on the bottom left part of the screen, I have highlighted landslide hazards. And those areas that have the darker green color have the most landslides, whereas that turquoise color has fewer landslides. So the Laguna is essentially through here. It's in the flatlands, so it's not susceptible to landslides, but the adjacent mountains are. So as we consider earthquakes and sediment basins, Remember, the sediment basins are where the sediment is the deepest. And on a previous map, I highlighted this. So here's Sebastopol I'm on the bottom right part of the screen. Here's Sebastopol. So this is essentially our Laguna de Santa Rosa. But this map is less about surface terrain. It's showing us at depth, like what is the depth of the bowl? But geology is never as simple as a cereal bowl. So the Katadi Basin is like its own really deep bowl. Windsor has its own really deep bowl as well. And notice that this Katadi Basin Bowl, where the deepest, the basin thickness is thickest and therefore deepest, that it kind of has this arrow almost shape that points towards downtown Santa Rosa. That causes the waves, the energy that's moving in the Katadi Basin, like the cereal that's shaking at depth, those kind of get concentrated or pushed towards Santa Rosa. So some of the worst shaking that's occurred in past earthquakes have in fact occurred beneath the, the city of Santa Rosa. Because not only do we have this Rogers Creek Fault that goes right through downtown Santa Rosa, in fact, that produced the earthquakes that we felt last month in September, on September 13th of 2022. But we also have these other adjacent faults in this area. But I wanna highlight that what I just did when I highlighted this is notice that the line is not straight. The fault is not straight. Generally, the faults in this region, they have what we call a right lateral motion. So if you are here, I'm on the right side of the screen, if you're standing on the X and you're looking past the fault and an earthquake occurs, everything will appear to move to the right. It doesn't matter which side of the fault you're on. You look past it and everything appears to move to the right. We call this a right lateral fault. So if you have this right step, eastward step in a right lateral fault, those arrows pull apart from each other and they create a depth, a deeper point within the deep, within the earth. And then the sediment itself is able to get deeper as a result. So a lot of these deep areas or these basins are just the result of the shapes of the faults. So as water deposits sediments in those basins, that sediment is unconsolidated, like cereal that is not glued together. And that motion of that sediment amplifies the seismic waves. Beneath the Santa Rosa Valley, it's very common to have close to about 120 feet. So right under here, under Santa Rosa, that's about, sorry, 1,200 feet right through here in orange. So the areas underneath the Katadi Basin are significantly deeper and that much more prone to shaking. So I have this video. The link is provided. So you're welcome to watch the entire thing in the future should you wish. This is from YouTube, and this is just a small snippet of a YouTube video entitled Rogers Creek Fault, looking at some of this basin data. In part one, we learned how sophisticated LIDAR technologies allowed more precise mapping of the Rogers Creek Fault System to the North Bay, revealing a longer and more complex fault system. In part two, the legacy of large earthquakes in our region and how local geology I increases the south and all start. around the Bay Area. This fascinating graphic illustrates relative shaking based upon geology, horizontal velocity increasing in the deep sedimentation around Santa Rosa, this finding a key to understanding why past quakes like the Great Quake of 1906 have been so devastating. Even though the actual surface break of the San Andreas Fault was clear out of Bodega, the, the level of shaking here in town was tremendous because of that amplification factor. Also. So in the past, we have evidence that this area has undergone a lot of shaking. So 
Here in the upper right corner is a earthquake model of how shaking was experienced during the 1906 earthquake, oftentimes called the San Francisco earthquake. But I am sorry to tell you, Santa Rosa experienced a lot more damage than San Francisco did because of these deep basins. So over here, where my little cursor is, where it says Sebastopol, that's the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The red is higher MMI or greater shaking intensity, as we can see on this graph, very similar to what they just showed in that last video. And you can see that the area beneath Santa Rosa, there's Santa Rosa Highway 12 and US 101. This area where it's deeper is where that motion was amplified. So on April 18th of 1906, early in the morning, when a magnitude around eight earthquake occurred, Santa Rosa had more damage than any other Bay Area city. The greatest loss of life was in downtown Santa Rosa, which was mostly built of brick buildings at that point. But there was also extensive damage in Healdsburg, Cloverdale, Geyserville, Hopland, and Ukiah. This historic picture in the bottom left part of the screen, that's downtown Sebastopol. We can see from this shake map associated with historical review of this earthquake that Santa Rosa, which I'm highlighting in a circle here, was a zone of very strong to violent shaking because of these deep, deep basins. And even though Santa Rosa experienced not only a high death toll, the overall volcano, volcano earthquake for the region caused 700 to 3,000 people to perish. And even though that destruction was very con concentrated in Santa Rosa area, a lot of the reports that come from this region that tell us about the response of the community reports resilience, community cooperation, neighbors helping each other, which is a story that unfortunately we've heard more recently because this is a community that has experienced disaster but we're also really good at surviving it and coming back from it. Now the Rogers Creek Fault, which is closer to the Laguna de Santa Rosa is incredibly complex. It's a little bit wider overall and it's actually a series of many small faults that make up the larger fault itself. And in 1969, the Santa Rosa earthquakes, which were magnitudes 5.6 to 5.7, so many times smaller than that 1906 earthquake. It caused pretty strong shaking in Santa Rosa and led to the damage of a number of buildings. In fact, when we look here at where the Rogers Creek goes through downtown Santa Rosa, it's adjacent to the hospital, the fire department, and the police station. So we recognize that there's a number of vulnerable structures there. When we consider a future earthquake scenario for the Rogers Creek Fault, this is actually one of the ones we're most concerned about because of all the faults in the Sonoma County area, the Rogers Creek Fault has the highest probability of producing a relatively large earthquake because it hasn't had a lot of our large earthquakes in the last few decades. But those earthquakes that have occurred in the past, they're responsible for uplifting the mountains, creating the topography we love so much. So I'm gonna bring this back around now. So we have our mountains that are created by faults that uplift. Our valleys and our mountains are parallel to each other because of fault topography. And then rivers move both parallel to and perpendicular to those fault lines, carrying water towards the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Now, as a result of our northwest, southeast topography due to the location of the faults and those rivers that are moving perpendicular to the faults, they incise or dig canyon themselves down into the mountains perpendicular in the northeast to southwest direction. So I'm gonna do a wiggly line for saying this is the orientation of many of those rivers. There's a reason I'm going over this again, because notice here, this is showing for 1964, this is the fire path associated with the 1964 fires called the Hanley Fire and the Nuns Canyon Fire. Now, a lot of the reason that these fires were extensive as they were is because they moved through river canyons, 
that were oriented northeast to southwest. They essentially moved from northeast to southwest as a result of wind direction. So that's the 1964 fire path. Here is our 2017 fire path. Same, almost exactly the same path overall because the fires were following the same river canyons. Here in the upper right is a short video that's looking at the progression of the Tubbs fire in the first 36 hours, starting on October um, 8th through 9th. Notice it is moving to the bottom left, which is towards the southwest general direction because it's following some of those river canyons that are moving perpendicular to the fault lines. The faults that create the topography, wind is partially controlled by topographic fluctuations. And so as that water or that wind is funneled into river valleys, it quite literally controls the direction that the fires progress as a result of wind-driven phenomenon. So winds from the Northeast, they drive fires. That's why when we have winds from the Northeast, we call that fire weather. So we've had fire events in this county in 1870, 1923, 1964, 2017, 2019, 2020. This is not an exhaustive list. In fact, I have another video here that I think does a great job of filling in some of the blanks. It goes from the late 1930s. And every color you see added as we progress through time is the footprint of a fire. And this is showing fire history from 1939 to 2017. The color coding is just under that year, which is changing quickly. So orange is more recent, purple is second most recent, and the yellow colors are the oldest. We have seen, <clears throat> excuse me, the same fire paths pretty consistently within the northeast to southwest wind corridors. That includes the Tubbs fire zone, the Sonoma Valley fire zone, the Geysers area, and the Guerneville area, which you can see right through here has not had recent fires. What controls the interval of fires, how often fires take place is lightning, which is very rare in this area. We don't really have the atmospheric phenomenon that brings a lot of lightning to this area. So most of the fires that start in this area are not lightning caused, but instead are caused by humans. The way we have interacted with our environment through fire suppression, as in stopping fires that would have consumed fuel so that future fires were not quite so bad, causing an increase in vegetation density because of not having previous fires to thin out the overall vegetation, changing vegetation type, and many times introducing vegetation that's more flammable like eucalyptus trees, but also <clears throat> humans overall causing ecosystem changes, changes to not only the plant community, but the animal community, changing the shape of the land, and overall changing land use, in many cases actually leading to slightly drier surface, even through pumping water out of the earth. So when we look at the fire history of Sonoma County, and we recognize our climate history of us moving towards a more droughty future, both as a result of natural climate change in addition to exacerbated or increased pace of climate change due to human activity, we recognize that we were already moving in towards a little bit more of a fire prone climate. But that faster climate change has just kind of pushed that envelope. And the fact that we have caused increased drying of the surface of the earth through something as simple as pumping groundwater out of the earth and decreasing the water table has just exacerbated that, which is one of many reasons that we've had an increase in the overall number of wildfires relatively recently. And right back to that Association of Bay Area Governments Hazard Viewer, everything you see, this is for the Sonoma County area, everything we see in yellow, orange, and red, those are fire hazard zones. But notice right through here, 
here is the Laguna de Santa Rosa, not in a fire hazard zone because it's in a lower west part of the topography. When we consider our historic fires that are really more driven by mountains, the topography of mountains in those drainage rivers that form perpendicular to the faults, that's really where the fires become the worst. It's the intersection of topography, weather, and of course, that which builds the topography are fault lines. So what we become aware of for future wildfires is when we have an atmospheric high pressure that builds to our east, causing the winds to flow from northeast to southwest. Those are the times when if there's already a fire that is burning, that that wind can push those fires down, not only down towards the surface of the earth, because that's what high pressure is, but it also pushes that air, funnels it through those river canyons and can cause that fire to move very, very quickly. The topography associated with our faulting has really led to this coupling of atmospheric events and fire events. So notice here, we call this the Diablo winds when we have those winds from the Northeast. And on October 8th and 9th, this is a wind map that shows that the fire or the wind origin was very strong and fast. Winds in some areas were clocked at over 60 miles an hour coming from the North Northeast, funneling that, that air down those valleys and causing those fires to move much too quickly. We call these winds continental winds. They source from the continents, therefore they're dry and warm, that much more conducive to causing fires to move relatively quickly. So when you hear about a Diablo wind mountain wave event, also known as north to northeast winds, that's when we become aware of possible fire weather. <clears throat> because when it comes to the history of fire prevention, what we recognize is that the way that we're preventing fire in the past has led to the conditions that exist today. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice apparently. <clears throat> so when we consider, <clears throat> excuse me, recent years, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, these are all satellite views of when fires were burning in this overall region. And notice what they all have in common. The smoke is blowing to the Southwest because the winds are coming from the Northeast. Once we know the processes that lead to a disaster, we know what to be aware of, what to look out for, and when to be prepared for a disaster. We also know that when we are climatically in a La Nina, the opposite of El Nino, therefore lacking in rainfall. And we add that global warming, increased atmospheric temperatures, plus that we've been in for over 10,000 years, this interglacial drying. We recognize that our region is conducive to wildfires because of this confluence of atmospheric events coupled with the topography created by faults. So yes, there will be more fires in the future, but we're very prepared for them here. Just think of how much things have changed in the last few years and how much we've learned from the recent past. At least when a disaster occurs, we can say we learn from it so that we can attempt to prevent that degree of a disaster into the future. So as we prepare for the future in the Laguna de Santa Rosa, we know that Sonoma County natural hazards are the result of ongoing geologic and climate trends, things that we don't really have control over, but we can be aware of our surroundings, aware of the processes taking place, and very importantly, being prepared to deal with disasters if and when they happen. We know that those earthquakes are creating the topographical changes that create the Laguna de Santa Rosa as we know it, it would not exist in its current shape without those earthquakes. We know that the fluctuations and precipitation lead to flooding and landslides, but also to droughts and wildfires as we swing from El Nino to La Nina. And that overall climate change has led this region to be increasingly dry and more conducive to the drought conditions that we're experiencing at this current time. 
And yet all of these things have brought us to our present time, to the place that we love so much. So even though these hazards exist and these disasters have been frightening of the past, we recognize that it is because of these events that we have the Laguna de Santa Rosa in the Santa Rosa area that we love so much. So I wanted to provide you with a few links. And since you'll have the recording of this, you'll be able to um, make use of these. The area of Bay, the Association of Bay Area Governments Hazard Viewer is what I've used for a lot of these maps. So it's abag.ca.gov. And that's where you can quite literally zoom into where you live and explore what kind of hazards are present for the area immediately around you. I highly, highly recommend that you get prepared for emergencies. Pack a go bag. That go bag is good for all disasters, whether it's a fire or a flood or an earthquake. That go bag is your personal survival kit that has the items that you want in it so that you have those things that are important to not only your survival, but the things that you would like to hold on to. I have provide um, a earthquake kit as well as a go bag packing list on my website at appreciatingearth.com forward slash emergency preparedness tracking. Prepare your property for fire, erosion, and flooding. Consider how you landscape, educate yourself on, for example, what hazards may occur and what you can do in the face of them. Be aware of weather, think northeast winds, that's when you become aware of the possibility of fire spreading quickly. Vote for the environment, know that we do as humans, we have the ability to change our surroundings. That means we can change our environment both towards the positive, as in easier to live within, or not. And be very intentional about land use. When we are preparing our land, we recognize that we're preparing our land to live on, but also in awareness of the hazards that we live with. Go ahead and check out my website at appreciateair.com. I have geology walks and talks and educational events available hit and miss throughout the year. And you can find out about those pretty easily through my Appreciating Earth newsletters that you can sign up for on my website. Carlos, I see that we have some questions. Are, would you like to let me know what some of those might be? Yeah, a few comments more than anything. I think you did a really good job of uh, explaining everything because not as many questions as I expected. But uh, there was a comment about the death tally from the 1906 earthquake yes. uh, highlighting there was 498 <laughs> deaths in San Francisco, 64 deaths in Santa Rosa, and 102 deaths in San Jose. So I'm assuming, well, I'll let you go ahead and <laughs> the discrepancy there as far as the numbers go. Well, and that makes sense because when we look at historical events, the death tolls oftentimes that are reported vary a lot because census records were not complete. And so that which was reported as a death toll, sometimes it's not actually associated with a natural disaster. And you might also have discrepancies between one community and the next. And historical records are very di difficult to, to determine which record is more correct than others especially for much, much older events. So I usually provide an entire range of possibilities rather than choosing a single number because I don't know which historical record is more correct than others. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I think that pretty much covered it. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to add them into the chat. Um, I do have all of the links and I'm sure if I missed any, uh, Nicole will share them with me and I will send them in a final email. Uh, with a recording of the video as well. And I'll be putting the video on YouTube uh, on the Laguna Foundation page. And I think that, as far as things go, covers it. Anything else on your end, Nicole? No, thank you so much for joining me and giving me a chance to talk about natural disasters. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. And I hope you look at some of our other events we have going on. Uh, a few more will be coming up in the next coming week. So, uh, Look forward to seeing you guys uh, in person and uh, in the next webinar as well. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night.